So finally, the long-awaited lesson for the reading section of the TOEFL exam. So if you want to know everything about the TOEFL reading section, including theory, examples, free exercises, and a lot more, just stay tuned. Now, before getting on with the content, I'm going to gently ask you to subscribe to our channel and click on the notification bell because we have tons of material on the TOEFL and on other exams such as the GMAT and the GRE. So if you're starting your TOEFL preparation, you better check our channel, check all of our past videos because we have tons of stuff in there that you need to check out. Also, don't forget to leave us a comment because we want to know what you think. In that way, we can serve you better. We, we know what things to improve, okay? So tell us what you think about this lesson in the comments below. So let's start right now with the lesson for the TOEFL reading section. So just as a little overview, the reading section is the first section of the TOEFL. So here we have a structure, right? We already went over this. So the TOEFL has four sections and the first section is the reading section. So in case it doesn't look familiar to you, in case you don't know what I'm talking about, in case you don't really understand the, the structure of the TOEFL too well, well then you better go to our introductory lesson for the TOEFL. Okay, because there I go in depth over the main things of the whole TOEFL exam, the main structures that you need to understand before watching this lesson. So just go there and you'll learn everything, all the general aspects of the TOEFL exam. So this lesson is about the reading section only. So now, a lot of people think that the reading section is kind of boring and actually there's nothing farther away from the truth. Okay, reading is marvelous. But now, what are you going to do on the TOEFL reading section? They are going to ask you to read, of course, but what are you going to read? You're going to read academic articles. This is important because you are not going to be reading newspaper articles. You are not going to be reading uh, blogs, things like that, right? Nothing colloquial, nothing friendly. These are academic articles. Think about this. What is the TOEFL's main market? What is the exam directed at? Especially the TOEFL IBT. It is directed usually at people, right, student, college students who want to go to an English-speaking country to study, right? So we're talking here about college level, college level material. So that's what you're going to be getting here for the TOEFL reading section also. Articles that you normally find in a textbook, in a college textbook. Nothing too specialized. We're talking here about first years of college. We're not talking about something that's a little bit more technical. But those are the kind of articles you're gonna get, right? Related to the natural sciences, biology, anthropology, maybe sociology, the arts, history, etc., etc. Right? Those are the main topics in the TOEFL reading section. So now that we've seen a little overview of what the TOEFL reading section is about, now that you know that if you don't really understand the exam structure, you need to go to our previous video, the one about the introduction to the TOEFL. Okay? Now that we've seen that, we can go over the structure for the reading section. So here's the structure. You get three passages, three articles, okay? And you get 10 questions per passage for a total of 30 questions in the whole section. Each, each passage is of about 700 words around that. So they are not too long, but they are not too short either. And usually they have anywhere between five to eight paragraphs. Overall, you get 54 minutes for the whole section, which means you get 18 minutes per passage. Okay, so here's how one of the readings would look like. Here you have the reading on the right. On the left, you have the question. Of course, you're going to scroll down the reading. The reading is always present, so basically you'll be able to read the whole thing at all times. Okay, the questions will change. The reading stays on the right hand. And then on the top right corner, you get a clock, right? You get the countdown which is very important for you to know how much time you have left. In this exam, it's also important to know that you can go back to a previous question to answer it, maybe if you left it blank, or to make changes to, to your answer, okay? Now, just as, as a little comment, I don't recommend doing this too much, though, because it's going to affect you in your time management, all right? But uh, anyways, I mean, you have to know that you, if you want to, you can go back and answer some questions. Okay, so now we can start with the actual lesson. First, I'm going to go over the strategy, the most important aspect that you need to know in order to, to deal with these passages, in order to attack the reading section. Okay, once we've covered that, I'm going to go very specifically over each question type. And at the end, I'm going to give you some important tips and tricks. Okay, but now before getting on with the strategy, though, before going to the strategy, 
If you want some free material, if you need some free exercises, go to the link in the description below and download your free PDF with free exercises. So if you need some free material, we've got you covered. Okay, so now let's start with the first part, the strategy. And the first part of the strategy is this. You need to apply the hunter method or the hunter technique as some people call it. Okay, what is the hunter method? Now, you have to know this. This is most likely not your first exam, all right? This is not the first exam that in which you are gonna get a reading section. Or most likely in your life, you've already taken some exams and you, you had to read, right? Now, there are different approaches to reading. Some people like to read the whole text, the whole article before they start answering, okay? We call that the scholar method, okay? That's not good for the TOEFL because if you do that on the TOEFL, you're gonna run out of time, okay? You don't need to read the, the whole passage before answering. Now, what I've seen other students do also in my 15 years of experience tutoring for the TOEFL, what they like to do is they like to read the first sentences of each paragraph. So they read the first sentence in each paragraph and they kind of like to get the big picture, kind of like to get a summary of what the passage is about. So they kind of know what it's about and they start answering, right? That's not too bad, but still that's not optimal. Why? Because you don't need that for the TOEFL, okay? The TOEFL is made for you to apply the hunter technique, which basically means you first read the question and then you go to the passage and you answer. Specifically, you look for the answer, you search for the answer, you are hunting the answer. You don't really care about the other parts of the passage until they ask you about them, okay? So you are gonna be searching for answers at all times. You don't need to read the passage before. You don't need to read the first sentence of each paragraph. You just need to read the question first go directly to, to the that part in which you believe the information is located and get your answer, okay? Some people might ask, but Rod, if I do this, I won't have a full comprehension of the whole passage. And yeah, that's partially true, but you don't need a full comprehension. You just need a good enough comprehension, okay? And that's the main part here. Because just think about this. If you read the whole passage, you spend your time, or actually you waste your time reading the whole passage, at the end, there might be several several pieces of information that you've spent your time on understanding that they don't ask you about, okay? And if they don't ask you about it, then we don't care about it, okay? So on the TOEFL, we just care about the answers. So, and, and also, by the time you finish the reading, you, you get to question number 10, you would have read most of the passage, believe me, because there are 10 questions. So you're going to be reading little by little by little and you get a good enough comprehension of the whole passage. Maybe not a 100%, not a complete comprehension, but, but a good enough comprehension in order to answer the last question. Okay, so that's a method. That's a technique you need to employ. If you start reading the passage before, if you want to read the whole article, that's not going to be good for you. Okay, you're going to run out of time. You're going to get stressed out. That's not good. That's not the way you should do it. So just go there and apply the hunter technique and you'll be safe. Strategy number two, answer chronologically. All right, what does it mean? What the hell does it mean to answer chronologically? Okay, basically you have to understand this. Uh, the first questions for the, the article for reading, right? We'll have to, uh, you'll find the answers to those first questions in the first portions of the reading, the first paragraphs. As you go to the latter questions, your answer will be located at the end of the passage. So that's it basically, right? So if you, uh, let's say you, you are answering question number two, all right, and you found your information, that the answer for that question in paragraph number two, that means that if when you get to question number three, the answer for that question number three will not be located before, will not be located in paragraph number one, it will be located after paragraph number two. Okay, so just to give you a brief example, here's how it goes. So in this case, I'm answering this question, right? Now, let's say that's question number two, okay? Now, if the answer to this question is in the highlighted portion that I've highlighted in yellow, okay? When the next question comes, which is question number three, let's say, I know because of the, or because the, the TOEFL is chronological, I know that my answer will be located after that um, the answer or the location of the answer of the previous question, so in this area here, because the TOEFL is chronological, and that's just what happens all the time, okay? Usually that's what happens, okay? So this works 90% of the time, but this is something, this is a hack a lot of people don't know about. They get confused and they don't know how to solve, they don't know how to answer. 
Okay, and that's very, very sad because they waste a lot of valuable time searching for the answer in the whole passage. And you shouldn't do that. Normally, you search for the answer in a very specific part of a passage that is right after the location of the, uh, of the answer to the previous question. So basically, you just have to look within a few lines. You don't have to go and scan the whole passage. And that's part, that's something a lot of people don't know, okay? And they make tons of mistakes because of that. Other than that, you also need to remember that most of the time, maybe most of the time, the TOEFL will actually tell you which paragraph the answer is should be located, right? So it'll tell you paragraph number six, this question, blah, 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 blah. So you know that only refers to that paragraph, okay? So it's very important to manage this concept because in that way you'll save a lot of time. Strategy number three, and that has to do with note taking, okay? A lot of people love to take notes and actually that's, that's really important for other sections of the TOEFL, such as speaking, listening, maybe writing, but not for reading, okay? In reading, we do not, I repeat, we do not want to take notes. That's just gonna waste our time, okay? That's a total waste of time. All right, so we don't wanna take notes, and we'll explain to you right now why it's not necessary for you to take notes. So basically, as we mentioned before, the TOEFL is chronological, right? And you have to apply the Hunter technique. So actually, every time you're answering, you're just reading a few lines, maybe three to four lines. So there's no reason to take notes because you, your memory is big enough to, to remember, to memorize that information, okay? So no notes for us, they won't help us. Actually, in this case, it will be more uh, uh, harmful than beneficial, okay? So we don't wanna do that. Now, what you do want to do though, what you do wanna do is you wanna keep track of your process of elimination, which is actually a strategy number four. Keep track of the things you eliminate, of the options you eliminate. So in order for you to, to be very organized when you're answering, you wanna keep track of the things you eliminate. So what you wanna do is you do a little chart like this one. You write down all the questions, the 10 questions for each reading, and then you place four options for each because most questions have four options, maybe excepting for the last one. Okay, but most questions have four options only. And then once you start eliminating one of those choices, you want to cross them out. Okay, because believe me, a lot of people, when they are, are pressed, they're nervous because they're taking the exam, what they do is they forget what they eliminate and they end up choosing, they end up picking an answer that they had, they knew that it was wrong. So sometimes I were going over the homework and we, I ask them, you know, why you chose this? And they go like, uh, I knew that was wrong, but I don't know why you chose it because they were nervous and they didn't have a good, they didn't keep a good track of their eliminations. Okay, so you don't want to do that. So you need to keep track of your eliminations when you're sure that something is wrong, just cross it out in your notes. But also this will help you for another reason because we've mentioned before that in the TOEFL you can go back to a previous question. And sometimes, I mean, we don't want to do that because of time management, right? The time limit. And of course, going back to answer previous questions is not something we want to abuse, okay? Because that, that will lead us into trouble with the time. But sometimes you're going to have to do it, maybe. Because especially at the beginning of the passage, sometimes you're going to see that you don't have all the information because you're just starting to read the passage. So for the first few questions, maybe the first couple questions, you don't have enough info and you are not certain of your answer. So you just mark an answer, but you're not sure about it. Now, here, that's the important thing. You need to keep track of the answers of or the questions that you're answering without certainty, okay? So like in this case, I'm marking, I'm, I'm drawing a box around the question, the question number because I'm signaling that I'm not sure about that answer. So in case I have time to return, then I'm gonna go directly to that question and I'm not gonna be looking for all the questions to know whether I was uh, right or wrong or whether I was sure or, or in doubt. Okay, so you just want to go back directly to the questions you had trouble on. So because of these reasons, keeping track of your process of elimination is tremendously beneficial and you need to do it, okay? And strategy number five has to do with time management. Okay, so just to review the times here, we have times, right? You get 54 minutes in total for the whole section, which means 18 minutes per passage. That gives you actually around, you have 10 questions per passage, so it gives you around one minute and 45 seconds per question. Of course, I don't like this average, okay? Because it means nothing for us. Why? Because different question types require different times. There are some 
questions that are hard, there are some questions that are easy. Okay, for you to know, usually vocabulary questions and pronoun questions, those are easy and they will need less time than the others. Lookup questions and other textual questions will be kind of on the average. And then inference questions, inserting questions will require a little bit more time. And then at the end, you have the chart, things that you have a chart or a big summary, which usually is the last question that will require way more time. So here you have the recommended times I give my students, okay? So those are the times I, I would recommend that you comply with on the TOEFL exam. Now, besides that, you should also remember something. Practice makes the master. So you need to, I mean, of course, now you know that you have 30 seconds to answer a vocabulary question. Perfect. But you need to remember that. You need to be aware of that. So in order for you to, to kind of internalize those times, you need to practice this over and over and over. Okay. Tons of times, tons of times of practice is important for you to kind of interiorize the time limits. Not only on this section, for all the sections in the TOEFL, practicing is important, especially for the time. So you need to be really familiar with them. And also, and also you need to know that you should be checking. You should be looking at the clock all the time or right? there is no way around it. Okay. And so you need to look at the countdown just to know how much time you have left. Okay. So that's very important. A lot of people want to ignore the, the clock. You shouldn't do that. You should be looking at it all the time. That's what everybody does, right? Every minute or so, you sh should be aware of the time, how much time has passed by, okay? So those two things. You need to interiorize your time to know what limits you have, but also you need to constantly be looking at the clock. Okay, perfect. So now we've covered the strategy, the main strategy, and now we're going to go and cover the question types, specifically one by one. But before that, if you want some free materials and free resources, go to the link in the description in which we have left a free PDF with tons of exercises for the TOEFL. Okay, so you, you have an excuse not to practice. Just go there and practice. Now we're going to get to the question types. So here we're going to see the main question types for the TOEFL reading section. So we've got the vocabulary questions and the pronouns. Then the lookup questions, basically they're going to ask you in the lookup for something that has been mentioned in the passage. Then we have the inference questions. Number four, inference questions are a little tricky. They require more practice. They are more difficult. Okay. And number five, inserting questions. So let's get to them. So first, the vocabulary questions are very uh, easy. Basically, you just need to know the definition of a word. Okay. Sometimes it could get a little tricky. You have to be very careful and try to replace those answer choices, those four options, replace each one in the one that you have in there. So what you're going to do right now is you're going to read this short paragraph and then we're going to solve this. So in this case, the word immortalized, first thing we want to do is we want to read the whole sentence in order to get the, the story, to get the meaning. The move came after increases in video resolution and quality marked a significant change in quality since Leo was immortalized on celluloid 64 years ago. Okay, so what does the word immortalize mean? Now we know the mortal uh, has to do with mortis. In a lot of Latin languages, mort means to die, right? So mortis, mortal, that means so something with life and death. So something related to death. Now, if you read the story though, the whole story, Leo is, he, he's been dead a long time ago maybe, but the thing is that he was the pet for this company. So it's not about killing him, right? Immortalize that the prefix im means something against that. So he hasn't died. So he cannot be killed. So letter A is out. Now revived. To revive somebody. Now it doesn't make sense for the lion, for an animal to be revived, right? What sense would it make? Nothing at all. So revived is out. So it could be perpetrated. It could be frozen. Perpetrated means that something stays. Right, something remains and frozen means that something of course I mean it kind of has the same meaning as perpetrated but frozen could also be the same thing as frozen like when you put it in the freezer right something doesn't move so in this case because they want to say he was immortalized 64 years ago basically the lion is a legend he's iconic that's what they were trying to say it needs to be perpetrated because it's not frozen frozen is something that doesn't move right and, and uh, maybe the 
the reputation of the lion has increased. We don't know. So he has been immortalized because the lion is a legend. So in this case, letter B would be our answer. So that's how we do this type of questions. We're going to go over to the second question here. Another word. Okay. Now this is a different passage. I want you to read the paragraph and then we're going to go over this uh, question. So it's been 10 years since Japan's Fukushima earthquake and tsunami. However, radiation fears have lingered in the area. And then they start talking about how people can forget about it, how destructive this uh, disaster was, right? Now, uh, the word lingered, what does linger mean? Well, I mean, if you know what linger means, of course, it's easy, right? Because there's going to be uh, several of them. There is only one thing. But uh, if you don't know what it means, then you're going to have to try to get context. Now, they tell you that the effects of this disaster are still, can still be felt by the people. People are still, uh, they live in fear, right? It's been 10 years, but the, the effects, the problems have increased in the last 10 years. That's what they're saying. So, the effects are still there. So, it cannot be passed. Letter C needs to be out because the fears have lingered in the area cannot be passed. Because if the, the fears have passed, then people will be sleeping normally. And they are not. They are still afraid. Now, originated. Does it make sense how radiation fears have originated now? Because 10 years ago they originated. Okay? And then, however, would it make sense? Because, however, it says uh, it's been 10 years, it's been a long time ago. However, there's still something going on. So it, it hasn't passed. That's the thing. So originated is out, passes out. You could have reappeared, you have persisted. Those two things could make sense. But in order for something to reappear, the, it has to be gone for a moment. It has to disappear, right? In this case, they don't give us an indication that this thing has, this disaster or the effects of the disaster have disappeared. That's why we have to go with persistent. Persistent basically remained, right? It has remained for uh, this long, okay? So that's the answer, letter D in this case. So now we're going to go over the second type of question. Here we have a pronoun question. Okay, when they talk about pronouns, usually they're going to use personal pronouns or demonstrative pronouns. Now, uh, again, I want you to read this thing. It's very similar to the paragraph we read before. And uh, focus on the pronoun it's. Okay. So you read it. And they ask us about the word it, right? Among its consequences, it says. Sleep problems have been the most common. Consequences of what? Now, we have to think about this. Sleep problems are a consequence of what? Of the earthquake? Of the contaminating? Of disaster? Of the disaster or of the power plant? Now, right away we have to eliminate contaminating because contaminating is an action. Actions can be referred to by pronouns, right? We don't use it to refer to, to an action normally. Especially a gerund like that. That's kind of weird. And, be, and besides, the, the effects of the contamination have with the sleep problems. It doesn't make too much sense. What, what are people afraid of? They're afraid of the contamination? No, right? So that's how. Now, between the earthquake and the disaster and the power plant, among those three, it can be the power plant because the sleep problems are not an effect of the power plant, right? People are not scared of the power. They're scared of, the, of a disaster or maybe an earthquake. So we have those two, A and D. Uh, C, I'm sorry, A and C. Now, what do we do here? Uh, let's read the sentence before. The Fukushima nuclear power plant was destroyed by the 2011 earthquake. Okay, the earthquake caused the destruction of the power plant, heavily contaminating the area and becoming the largest disaster in the country's history. So what is the largest disaster? I mean, the, the earthquake or the effects that the fact that the earthquake destroyed the, the plant. So in this case, the problem wasn't just the earthquake. The problem was that the earthquake caused the destruction of the plant. Uh, we're imagining this is a nuclear power plant, right? So <laughs> that's got huge implications. So it's not only the earthquake. So it's a whole disaster. And the disaster is C. So that's our answer. C is uh, the, the referent, the, the antecedent for it. Very good, so now we're going to come over to a lookup question. So here you have a couple of paragraphs. I want you to read both of them so you can get a good sense of the story, okay? Just read them, read it quickly, pause the video if you need to, and then we're going to go to the question. 
Okay, so the question is this one. In paragraph 2, this one here, what is mentioned as a factor that made the new computer-generated mascot possible? Okay, a factor. That, that, that's our keyword, factor, that made it possible. Something that tells you that before that factor, it was not possible, right? Before that, that uh, factor came along, you couldn't uh, make a, a computer-generated model or, or a computer-generated mascot, okay? So let's read the, sen let's read the, the paragraph. Now, after almost 100 years, let's look for the keywords here. here. We have to focus on the keywords. The keyword is a new factor and possible. So, uh, after almost 100 years, MGM is replacing its mascot for a near identical computer generated duplicate. All right, they give us the context here, but they don't tell us if, about a factor that makes it possible. The move came after. Now, after could be because after is af after something, so it could be something that enables it to, to make the change. The move came after increases in video resolution and quality marked a significant change in quality since Leo was immortalized 64 years ago. Okay, so, so that could be. They say, after increases in video resolution and quality marked a change in quality. So basically, I think that's what they're saying is that uh, right now, because the technology is more advanced, no, they can do it. Okay, so that's that, that's a factor. Let's see in the next sentence if we can get another factor. We've got um, MGM originally planned to debut its new mascot. That's a, that's a different thing. It's not about a factor. It's about where or when they're going to show the mascot, the new mascot. So we already have our answer. It's about the new technology. Uh, letter A, computer generated images became cheaper. Cheaper is talking about prices. And they don't say anything about cheaper, anything about it being uh, less expensive. So that's how technology improved. That's kind of broad. That's kind of broad, but it could be. Let us see. MGM's board approved of the computer image. It's not about a board's decision. Leo died of old age. It's not about that. So letter B has to be the answer. Okay. So that's how you answer a lookup question. Now let's do another one. Okay. Now here we focus on keywords. You see next sentence here. Number two, uh, next question, I'm sorry, for the lookup. In paragraph two, what information is provided? So this one is a lookup question because uh, they have mentioned certain information, okay? Now, the best way to go here would be to go sentence by sentence and make a little summary. So I'm gonna read the first sentence. Now, after almost 100 years, MGM is replacing its mascot for a near identical computer generated duplicate. So that's talking about what they're replacing it with and also they're talking about uh, the time that has passed, 100 years, okay? That's information. Uh, is there anything in there in, in the, I chose a date at which Leo was born? No, the reasons why James Bond, James Bond films was really no. Computer resume is expected to be no. Difference between the real and the computer no, nothing. Second sentence, move came after increase in the video resolution, blah, blah, blah. Since Leo was immortalized it's a lot 64 years ago, that gives me information on when Leo was immortalized 64 years ago. That, that's what they took the, the picture, right? They took the photo of Leo. And, uh, and what was the factor in order to enable this move? But they don't say anything about it, that those four answer choices. Uh, sentence number three. MGM originally planned to debut its new mascot in the latest James Bond, James Bond film. Okay, however, no time to die was delayed from... 2019 to 2021 due to the coronavirus pandemic. Okay. Um, okay, so in this case, they tell you the data which Leo was born. No. Reasons why over James Bond was delayed. Yes. All right, that's the answer. Because in that sense, you find it, right? Do to is a keyword for why. Reasons why, right? Due to the coronavirus pandemic. So it was delayed because of, the, of COVID. Okay. So that, that's most likely the answer. Now, let us see when the computerized image is expected to be released. In the last sentence, they tell us something about it, but not about when. They tell us about where, right? MGM has decided Leo's digital lookalike will be seen with the upcoming films, Dog and Respect. Okay, but they, they don't give us a date. That's why letter C can be the answer. And uh, last one, the differences between the real and the computerized lions. Uh, no, we don't have anything about the difference, so our answer would be B as in baby boy, okay? So that's the answer. Now, next question type, the inference question. This inference is way more difficult than the others. Why? Because the inference, basically, they're going to ask you about something that hasn't been mentioned, 
that something has been suggested. Now, we have a whole, whole course on inferences because these type of questions are tricky, okay? But the main advice I'm going to give you right now is that when you have an inference, you either do it because of compliments or you do it because of, uh, let's say, uh, you, you reunite information, okay? That's what you do it with. I'm going to give you a brief example right now. Okay, really brief example. Okay, so here we're going to do a crash lesson for inferences. This is, this is a very short version of our lesson, okay? So just a little things that, that will get you going. The most basic things about inferences. So you can get an inference, for example, by compliments. For example, the first statement says, most students studying for the TOEFL have subscribed to this channel. Now here you notice they're giving you quantity words. In this case, most. Okay, so we're gonna play with that. We're gonna get that and we're gonna get the inference. So our inference is some students studying for the TOEFL have not subscribed to this channel. And by the way, if you you are one of those students who haven't subscribed, subscribe to this channel because you're gonna get a lot of information here if you're studying for the TOEFL, the GMAT, the GRE, or if you're, you just wanna learn some English. Okay, so you better subscribe. But now, this is an inference. Why some? Why is that an inference? Because they, in the statement, they don't tell us that some students haven't subscribed. That because they're using a quantity word, we can get the complement of most. Complement of most would be some, or it could also be less than half. But we know that. That's one type of inference using complements. The other type of inference would be using replacements. Okay. For example, we have a couple of statements here. Joe is a human, human being. Therefore, he is mortal, okay? So he's a human, and therefore, is basically because of that, right? As a consequence, he is a mortal. Now, uh, we can reunite this too. Actually, we say Joe is equal to human, human being. Joe is equal mortal. So basically, it's like an equation, right? We replace him, and we have humans are mortal, okay? Human beings are mortal. So that's how we get our inference by using a replacement. So now let's go back here to the question. Now, in paragraph two, which of the following is true about the computerized mascot? Now, whenever you see the word is true, that's a big indicator that that question is an inference question, all right? Something that's true, something that must, must be true is an inference, all right? Now, uh, let's see, let's, let's analyze the answer choices. It has better quality than the real one. Do they ever mention about the quality who is better? We don't know, actually, if we, we read the, sec, uh, the second sentence, that could give us an indication that you have a better uh, technology to do it, but they don't compare, actually, the quality of the, of the picture, of the, of the actual lion to the digital mascot, okay? Uh, about the mascot, here, they're not saying about the quality of the, of the whole um, videos, right? They're saying the quality of the mascot, the letter A can be the answer. Let it be, it will appear in a James Bond movie. No, that's not, that doesn't have to be true. It was supposed to appear at first, but then uh, it was delayed. And now it will be released in other films, Dog and Respect. So that's how. Let us see, it has yet to make its debut. Yep, that's true, right? Because in the last sentence it tells, it has decided, uh, MGM has decided, I'm sorry, Leo's digital lookalike will be seen. All right, so it hasn't been shown yet hasn't been shown. Okay, so that's the answer most likely. Letter D, Leo the Lion is still alive. They, they never say anything about Leo the Lion. Okay, they just say that he, he they took a picture of the lion 64 years ago. Now, if we know about lions, most likely the lion is dead, has been dead for a long time, right? But uh, yeah, they don't say, they never mention. It, it could be dead. So whenever you say, you say, for example, it could be dead. So when we do inferences, we kind of throw the negative. Can the lion be dead according to the information? Yeah, it can be dead. So letter D doesn't necessarily have to be true. Therefore, it's not an inference. Now, if we do the same thing with letter C, could this digital mascot have made its debut? And then you say, no, it, ha it can't possibly have made its debut. Why? Because uh, the last sentence goes against it, right? It, it tells us it will be seen in the future. So we cannot really uh, justify the negative so letter D, letter C, I'm sorry, is our answer because of that. Okay, that's how we prove an inference question. You just try to justify the negative. See if the, if the contrary could make sense according to the information that has been provided. 
Now we come to the next type of question, inserting. Now, inserting questions are a little tricky. They'll give you four points here, like this ones, okay? Usually they're gonna call them A, B, C, and D. They're gonna give you one more sentence about the same thing, and they're gonna ask you to put it in the place that, that it fits the best, okay? Now you have to logically see where this new piece of information would make sense. Now let's read this piece of information. It says, the company's marketing team concluded that newer generations want to enjoy a more technological experience. Okay, so they're talking about the marketing team. They're talking about um, that the reason why they want to change the mass. One of the reasons why they want to change it. Okay, because these newer generations, they like things that are more technology, more more related to technology, right? So the first one. Let's see the first. If if we go to the first uh, square here. Could it be before now, after almost 100 years, MGM is replacing its mascot? No, why? Because the first sentence, this sentence here, is giving you context. So that context is necessary to be at the beginning before we start talking about the reasons why they're changing it. So first they have to tell us that there's going to be a change in order for us to later discuss about the reasons. Okay, so the first one can be number two. First thoughts about the change came after increases in video resolution and quality mark. All right, they're telling us here, they're giving us a keyword, first thoughts. So they, at first, started thinking that they could make the change because it was possible. Okay, so because of that word, first thoughts, that uh, that has to be the first thought, so that has to be the first reason mentioned. Okay, so if we're gonna add this additional re reason, it has to come after. Now let's see that three. MGM originally planned to debut its new. So they start talking about the, the debut now, right? So basically this piece of information has to be before the debut because they're already talking about, first they give you context, sentence number one. Sentence number two gives you one reason why they want to change the line number. And sentence number three gives you a, the debut. They talk about the debut. So those are different things. This additional sentence is to give you a reason. So it has to go with sentence number two. So it's either B or C, and because of what we mentioned before, sentence number two has to be the first reason, so this new additional sentence needs to go to letter C. Okay, that's the place where it belongs. So that's how you do this sorting question. Uh, basically, you have to read uh, the whole paragraph, and you have to try to relate them to the, uh, to the information that is at the sites, or on the sites, okay? And you have to look for keywords. Like in this case, we look for first. We have to know where the context is at. Sometimes you also, sometimes you're going to have to read the last sentence of the previous paragraph or maybe the final, the, the first sentence of the next paragraph, okay? So that, that's how you do this. They are not that difficult. Just uh, try to get the context, the whole context. That's the most important thing here. Okay, so tips and tricks now. Tips and tricks, one of the most important parts. Okay, we've already covered the strategy. We've already covered each question type is specifically, now we're gonna go over the tips and tricks. Two main tips and tricks. The first one is vocabulary, all right? And a good knowledge, a good proficiency of vocabulary is crucial for this section. In all my years of experience, I've seen students, the ones who have trouble usually are the ones that don't have a good vocabulary base. So, of course, because sometimes they are able to speak, right, colloquially, but if they are not readers, if they, don't, they are not used to reading academic topics, they, there are a lot of questions they won't know the meaning of. So it's very important for you to get a good vocabulary base. How do you do that? My main advice would be go to Google. Go to Google and search something like basic vocabulary for astronomy or basic vocabulary for history, something like that, okay? And there's gonna be tons of material, but you need to know those, those words, okay? I'll leave you here, some vocabulary for natural sciences, okay? This is the main vocabulary for natural sciences on the TOEFL. Now, my main advice here also would be, you don't need to know the definitions of these words in English. A lot of people try to kind of memorize the definitions in English, but the, the problem is that if you don't have a high level of English, you aren't gonna remember those definitions, okay? You're gonna forget them very quickly. Now, what you need to do is, you need to know the words, but then translate them to your own language, to whatever language you speak. Okay, because chances are that you truly know the word, you know the concept, you just don't know that word in English, but you know the concept, what it means. 
Okay, now in case you don't know something, in case you translate it and not even in your own language you know that word, then look for the definition, but in your own language. Because that's important, that's the way you're going to learn and you're going to memorize better. Okay, we don't need to hear, do everything in English necessarily, as long as you know the, the word in English, but then you know the definition in your own language, that's what matters, because when you're reading, what you're doing is you, you're imagining things. So as long as you can imagine that word, that, that works. Okay, so that's what you want. And advice number two here, tip and trick number two would be practice makes a master. And I'm pretty sure you've heard me say this several times before, okay? Practice makes a master. Now, before you even attempt taking the TOEFL, you should have, I mean, have done several exercises, quality exercises, quality material, official TOEFL exercises, okay? Around 50 readings, at least. Now, 50 readings is each, each reading has 10 questions, so you're going to do at least 500 questions and that's going to kind of build you up. It's going to teach you how to approach these questions. But now what people don't understand though is that you need to have two different type of strategies, type of practices. The first one is with TOEFL official material, read around 50 readings, but that's too little though. I mean, that's going to help you to kind of get acquainted with the time limits and also to be able to answer. But in order for you to get more vocabulary, you need to read way more than that. But of course, I know that getting official material is difficult. So you need to just complement those readings with other sources. So I'm going to leave here a couple of sources, sciencedaily.com for you to get readings on um, natural sciences and history today for you to get readings on history. So you need to complement this with academic articles. Okay? Guys, only academic articles. A lot of people come to the preparation and, say, and tell me, you know what, right? I'm reading Harry Potter, I'm reading Game of Thrones, whatever, I'm reading novels, I'm a reader. That's not gonna help you too much. Of course, everything adds, everything adds up, that's good. But it's not too efficient. If you wanna get good at the top of reading section, you wanna read academic articles, okay? And just go to these blogs, find maybe a couple articles every single day. You'll see that you learn tons of new vocabulary and a lot of more things, okay? So practice makes a master, but you need to practice a lot, a lot of reading. So this has been the free lesson for the reading section of the TOEFL exam. I know this lesson will be very helpful for you. Okay, so I wanna know what you think, so leave us a comment below, and also don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so before, and click on the notification bell to get updated with our latest, latest information, or right, the latest content. This has been the first video of a series of videos for the TOEFL IBT. Actually, we're putting out the whole course, a whole free course, with all sections, this has been the reading section. Next up, go to the listening section, okay? Now, also don't, don't forget that you have some free material in the description below. Go to the description below, find the link to your free PDF file with, with free exercises, okay? So there you have it, everything you need to get a really high score on the TOEFL, okay? So my name is Rod, I'm with Liberty Test Prep, and thank you for watching. Until next time.